Right now, we are working through a very short series that we have called Identity Statement. Uh, the, our Identity Statement is basically, um, it's a statement that you see in our literature. It's a statement we talk about from time to time in front of the church. But basically, with this little statement, we are answering the question, who am I? Or more, or perhaps it's better to be said, who am I in Jesus Christ? Now, if you were here last week, um, we talked about the fact that in Christ Jesus, he has made us his children, and that's a beautiful thing. That means that as his children, we have a Father in heaven whose arms are always holding us tight, and we have a Father in heaven who said, you are now a new creation, and you are a work in progress. So we're promised to have a Father in heaven who is always working on us, and it's a beautiful gift. This week, we're going to talk about, um, I'll put it up here, we will talk about saved by grace. And next week, as I said last week, my beautiful, brilliant, awesome, lovely wife will be preaching the message next week, so it's going to keep going up. Uh, She's going to talk about what does it mean to be freed to love. Um, So thank you ahead of time. Now, this week, saved by grace, what does that mean? Let's take it, let's just start with the word saved first, a basic definition. When we talk about being saved, we're saying that at one time... We were in this space over here, but we've been delivered from this space, and we've been brought into a new kind of space. This space is defined by slavery towards sin and death, darkness and brokenness. And when we say that we've been saved, we say we've been brought from this area, this jail cell, this house of darkness, and God has brought us into this new space that is defined by freedom That is defined by forgiveness and peace and love and joy. And this is a good place to be. Saved from death. Saved for life. Isn't that good? Amen. Now that's saved. Now when we say grace, what are we talking about? We're saying that as we've been brought from here to here, we were not able to do that on our own. The reason we've been brought from A to B is because God did it. In fact, on our own, we were powerless to do it on our own. But as we cried help to God, he rescued us and he brought us into this new place. So as Christians, we do not boast in our works and who we are and what we do. We boast in the grace of God and we live a life of gratitude because of what he has done. So with that, as we seek to understand and unpack this statement a little bit and what it means for us, I actually want to start with a parable this morning. But it's not a parable from the Bible, although you'll quickly recognize it um, as a parable that reflects the Bible. And it's told by a guy named Philip Yancey who wrote a book called um, What's So Amazing About Grace. And a wonderful story, so listen up. Here we go. It takes place in Michigan, where I'm from, so we know it's a good story. Okay. A young girl grows up on a cherry orchard just above Traverse City, Michigan. Her parents, a bit old-fashioned, tend to overreact to her nose ring, the music she listens to, and the length of her skirts. They ground her a few times, and she seethes inside. I hate you, she screams to her father when he knocks on the door of her room after an argument. And that night, she acts on a plan she has mentally rehearsed scores of times. She runs away. She's visited Detroit only once before on a bus trip with her church youth group to watch the Tigers play. Because newspapers in Traverse City report in lurid detail the gangs, the drugs, and the violence in downtown Detroit, she concludes that this is probably the last place her parents will look for her. California, maybe, or Florida, but they will not look for me in Detroit. Her second day there, she meets a man who drives the biggest car she's ever seen. He offers her a ride. He buys her lunch, arranges a place for her to stay. He gives her some pills that make her feel better than she's ever felt before. She was right all along. She decides her parents were keeping her from all the fun. The good life continues for a month, two months a year. The man with a big car, she calls him boss, teaches her a few things that men like. And since she's underage, men will pray a premium for her. She lives in a penthouse and orders room service whenever she wants. 
Occasionally she thinks about the folks back at home, but their lives now seem so boring that she can hardly believe she grew up there. She has a brief scare when she sees her picture printed on the back of a milk carton with the headline, Have you seen this child? But by now, she has blonde hair, and with all that makeup and body-piercing jewelry she wears, nobody would ever mistake her for a child. But by now, oh, excuse me, there we go. Besides, most of her friends are runaways, and nobody squeals in Detroit. After a year, the first signs of illness appear, and it amazes her how fast the boss turns mean. These days we can't mess around, he growls. And before she knows it, she's out on the street without a penny to her name. She, she still turns a couple tricks at night, but they don't pay much. And all the money goes to support her drug habit. When winter blows in, she finds herself sleeping on metal grates outside the big department stores. Sleeping is the wrong word. A teenage girl at night in downtown Detroit can never relax her guard. Dark bands circle her eyes. Her cough worsens. One night, as she lies awake listening for footsteps, all of a sudden, everything about her life looks different. She no longer feels like a woman of the world. She feels like a little girl. Lost in a cold, frightening city, she begins to whimper. Her pockets are empty and she's hungry. She needs a fix. She pulls her legs tight underneath her and shivers under the newspapers that are piled on her coat. Something jolts a synapse of memory, and a single image fills her mind of May in Traverse City, Michigan, when a million cherry trees bloom at once, with her golden retriever dashing through the rows and the rows of trees in a chase of a tennis ball. God, why did I leave, she says to herself. And pain stabs at her heart. My dog back home eats better than I do now. She's sobbing. She knows in a flash that more than anything else in the world, she wants to go home. Three straight phone calls, three straight connections with the answering machine. She hangs up without leaving a message the first two times. But the third time, she says, Dad, Mom, it's me. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way, and I'll get there about midnight tomorrow. If you're not there, well, I guess I'll just stay on the bus until it hits Canada. <laughs> Sorry. It takes about seven hours for a bus to make all the stops between Detroit and Traverse City. And during that time, she realizes the flaws in her plan. What if her parents are out of town and they missed the message? Shouldn't she have waited another day or so until she could talk to them? Even if they are home, they probably wrote her off as dead a long time ago. She should, have been given, she should have given them some time to overcome the shock. So her thoughts bounce back and forth between these worries and the speech she's preparing for her daddy. Daddy, I'm sorry. I know I was wrong. It's not your fault. It's all mine. Dad, can you forgive me? She says the words over and over, her throat tightening as she rehearses them. She has never apologized to anyone in years. The bus has been driving with lights on since Bay City. Tiny snowflakes hit the road and the asphalt steams. She's forgotten how dark it gets at night out there. A deer darts across the road and the bus swerves. Every so often a billboard, a sign posting the mileage to Traverse City. Oh God, she thinks to herself. When the bus finally rolls into the station, the air brakes hissing in protest. The driver announces in a crackly voice over the microphone, 15 minutes folks, that's all we have here. 15 minutes to decide her life. She checks herself in a compact mirror. She smooths her hair, and she licks the lipstick off her teeth. She looks at the tobacco stains on her fingerprints and wonders if her parents will notice if they're there. She walks into the terminal not knowing what to expect, and not one of the thousand scenes that have played out in her mind prepares her for what she walks into. There in the concrete walls and plastic chairs bus terminal in Traverse City, Michigan, stands a group of 40 family members. Brothers and sisters, great aunts and uncles and cousins and a grandmother and a great grandfather to boot. They are all wearing ridiculous looking party hats and blowing noisemakers. And taped across the entire wall of the terminal is a computer generated banner that reads, Welcome Home. 
Oh, excuse me. I remember. Yeah, <laughs> you can praise God. That's good. Um, I'm sorry I'm crying. I, I was reading that book in preparation for the sermon. I read that story. It was just one of those. I just set the book down and just take it in. So beautiful. Oh, it's not even done yet. Okay. So out of the crowd, um, out of the crowd of well-wishers breaks her dad. She looks through tears and begins the memorized speech. Dad, I'm sorry. I know he interrupts her. Hush, child, we've got no time for that. No time for apologies. You'll be late for the party because there's a banquet waiting for you at home. Amen. What does that story sound like to you? The prodigal son in modern day story. Oh, man. Could you imagine? I was just thinking, what has it got to be like to be this girl on the bus? on her way home, knowing she slapped her parents in the face, she ran away, she threw her life away, and now she's going home, it's her only hope, and she sits there just wondering, okay, man, what's it going to be like when I get home? What is the love of my father going to look like? And what does she discover? The love of the Father is greater than she could possibly imagine. What is the extent of that love? What does she learn? The extent of her Father's love is infinite. What is the nature of the Father's love? What does she learn? She learns that the Father's love is unconditional. She shows up ready to grovel and beg for forgiveness. And Daddy says, no. Say that for another time. Because anyways, that's more about you than me anyways. What I've wanted the whole time is I've wanted you to come home because you're my daughter. And it doesn't matter how dark you've been and how far you've fallen. Because you're my daughter and all I can say is I'm glad you're home. And the whole family's glad you're home. And so everybody breaks out in a party. One of those beautiful images of all time. You know... The heartbeat of Christianity from the very beginning has been this message. For God so loved the world that he sent his son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, period. There's no strings attached. There's no loopholes. A right relationship with God and eternal life are a gift from God that he has offered to every last human being who walks on planet earth, regardless of how far they've fallen. God says, listen, if you turn to me, if you believe in me, I will give you new life and you can come home and I will hold you in my arms. It's one of the things that makes Christianity different than any religion in the world. Every other religion provides a framework, things to do that will put you in relationship with God. Christianity, what do we say? We say actually it doesn't work that way. In fact, if we tried to get to God on our own, we would never make it. But as Jesus said, listen, you have to look to me. If you believe in me, just cry help. And I'll help you. That's how we get to God. Because God has made the way for us. It's that simple. Now, in Jesus' day, this idea was really a new idea. And it was revolutionary. It was counter-cultural. It was counter-religious in his day. See, most of the religious people, and the most religious people were the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, They believed that if they fulfilled the law, right? If they did all the works of the law, if they were righteous, then God will show up. In fact, their pursuit of living the good life was such that they they made up rules, trying to find rules they could follow to earn God's favor. And the problem with this, though, is they were making these rules and trying to be the most perfectly righteous people is that they looked at society and they started to make judgments about people, right? So these are the Pharisees and the teachers of the law did. They say, okay, we've made the rules, we've made the laws, of course we're keeping them, so God's on our side, right? But there's a lot of you out there who are not following the rules 
And in fact, you are destroying the rules. And so they labeled these people. See, the Pharisees would label these people as sinners. And when they called people sinners, what they were saying is, listen, these are people who are so messed up. They have no chance with God. And they wrote them off. That's what the religious people did. And not only did they write them off, they said, listen, these sinners are so bad that in order to make sure that they don't contaminate us, we're going to make rules about interacting with them so we don't have to see them. And so they made rules about interacting with other ethnicities like the Samaritans or the tax collectors or other types of sinners. And if you interacted with them, it was a huge no-no. And if you're interacting with sinners, then obviously you're not following the rules yourself, right? And you don't deserve heaven either. The problem is Jesus shows up. Jesus decides that he spends most of his time with the sinners, the tax collectors, the Samaritans. Jesus goes to all the places that the religious people say, we won't go there. And this really ticks off the religious leaders. In fact, one time Jesus was teaching, and by the way, as Jesus taught, who was coming to Jesus? Well, everybody was, but the sinners were coming too. Because for the first time, someone who was religious was actually saying, hey, come see me. This is actually good news. And so Jesus is teaching, you have hyper-religious people, you have the sinners and the broken people, and the people over here, is they see the sinners around Jesus are saying, they're just murmuring among themselves. Who does this guy think he is? He, he eats with sinners. He dines with them. He goes to parties with these sinners, and they scorn him for it. Now Jesus, who heard them, and he could read their minds as well, knows what's going on, and he responds by telling three of my favorite stories in the Bible. The parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the prodigal son, which we heard a version earlier. And I want to read to you, we're going to ha- handle one of them this morning. This is from Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 7. This is Jesus' answer to the religious people. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and he eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and he says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who do not need to repent. Jesus says to the religious leaders, my friends, you have gotten God all wrong. He's not this angry God who sits down and just waits for people to get it right. And then after they get it right, maybe he'll let them come to him. No, God's not like that at all. God is much more like a shepherd. A shepherd who chases his sheep. When one of his sheep goes astray, what does this God do? He follows, he looks, and he finds. See, since the day we were born, the day that anybody has been born, what I can tell you is this, God has been on our tails Ever since that day, he's been chasing us. The question is, do we recognize it or not? Now, Jesus, of course, he does the chasing, doesn't he? And when he finds us, he's so ready to pick us up and throw us on his shoulders. But yet, there is one thing that we have to do. What does Jesus say here? We must repent. What does the word repent mean? Simply, here's what it means. The word repent means to turn. You're going this way, you're trusting in yourself, and to repent means to turn around and to trust in God. In the scriptures, it's also talked about as having faith. It's uh, another way to say it. To repent is to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But Jesus says, you're my lost sheep, but the minute you turn, I pick you up, And then, this is crazy, if you think about this, because it's happening right now. The scriptures say that literally, 
Heaven is rejoicing. I mean, can you even imagine that? That there is a party going on in heaven because somebody turns to God and lets God pick them up. I was thinking um, about that image a little bit. I was like, you know, this is what it looks like to me. It's like when you're like, at a really huge sporting event, at a huge arena, right? And perhaps one of the athletes gets injured and they're laying on the ground and they're kind of rolling around. The medical team comes forward, they do their thing, and the whole crowd just watches in anticipation and silence. Do you have to get the stretcher or is he going to get back up? And then once they see the athlete, they lift up their hand, right? And then someone on their team picks them up. And then what happens in the stadium? Everybody roars, right? They're just cheering. Woo! And somehow, when any person on this earth turns to Jesus Christ, this is exactly what's happening in heaven. We're here on this earth but there's always a party going on upstairs because people are always turning to Jesus as we speak right now, and it's the best thing in the world. But why is it, why is it that God rejoices so much? Here's why. Because whenever somebody turns to Jesus... Jesus gets exactly what he has wanted from the day that you were born. He wants you. And he wants your heart. And when someone turns and the angels in heaven see Jesus has gotten what he wants so bad, they can't help but to throw a party. God took a huge risk when he gave each of us free will, didn't he? Because not all of us, not all people will turn to Jesus and hold out their hand to find salvation. But God gave us a free will because he didn't want to force us to love him. He didn't want to make robots who would just bow down at command and force to love him. That's not love. God says, I want the real thing. So he took a risk and he gave us free will. And we all have that choice, whether we're simply going to reach out our hand and cry help. An author named Henry Nowen uh, explains it this way. He does a great job. He says, God rejoices not because the problems of the world have been solved, not because all human pain and suffering have come to an end, but they're good things, of course, not because thousands of people have been converted and are now praising him for his goodness. No, God rejoices because one of his lost children has been found. Henry Nowen gets it just right. The source of God's joy is very personal because each of us matter to God more than we can possibly know. When I was at family camp, um, man, a few months ago now, we had this great speaker, and he shared an illustration with us that really helped put grace into perspective. Maybe you've heard it before, but it's a good one, so you can hear it again. How many of you have ever been driving and you've gotten pulled over? Come on, confession in church. Come on, come on. I have been pulled over too. Um, <laughs> now, some of you are masters at talking your way out of tickets. Raise your hand if that's you. <laughs> some of us, for some reason, we get pulled over and we just get nailed. <laughs> we just can't do anything about it, right? When we get a ticket, though, from the officer... We absolutely deserve that ticket, don't we? Although, of course, we will protest it with all of our might. You know, it wasn't posted just the right way. I missed the sign. I'm late for something. We have all of our excuses. But he gives us a ticket. But what if, instead of giving us the ticket, the police officer, he walks back to his car. He's there for a minute. And then he comes back to us. He says, uh, hey, Greg, just want to let you know, today I'm going to have mercy and you are off the hook. How does that sound? That's good, huh? It's a free gift. It's a wonderful thing. Is that grace? What do you think? It's a good question. Well, our speaker said, no, that's not grace. And I think he's right. He said, what has just happened to you actually is mercy. You have been let off the hook. 
He said, this is what grace is about. He said, picture this incident. The police officer comes up to the car. The windows roll down. The police officer says, sir, you've been speeding. Or perhaps, sir, your license plate's tags have expired. The man looks up to the police officer with tears in his eyes. He says, listen, I haven't been able to replace my tags because I don't have the money for it. If I put the money to replace my tags... I'm not going to be able to put food on the table for my little baby. And so I've made this choice. I'm deeply sorry. The police officer goes back to the car. The police officer writes a ticket, folds it up, brings it to the man, and he says, Sir, I'm sorry. I still have to write you a ticket because this is justice. He gives the man the ticket. The police officer walks away. But then as a man opens up the ticket, he's discovered that the police officer not only put the price of the ticket in cash between it, but he's put far more money than that. He opens up, let's say he finds $500. This captures grace well. Here's why. Listen, a true gift has value. And a true gift costs something. If we are let, or if the man in the car is let off the hook, justice is not served, and it costs the police officer absolutely nothing. But grace is a gift that has value, a lot of value. And so when he receives the ticket, but then he receives the money, now he receives a gift that he can call grace. Now, some people, some of us maybe in this room or people who think about Christianity, they'll bring up this idea, well, why is it that Jesus had to go to the cross and die? That sounds kind of twisted. What an odd thing to say that had to happen for salvation. But here's the deal. God is a just God. God rights wrongs. There are consequences for evil. But that's a good thing, isn't it? I mean... The fact that sex trafficking is happening right now. The fact that many are being slaughtered in the Middle East. We have a God who doesn't sit back and doesn't care. We have a God who's angered by those things. A God who is just. A God who someday will put all things right. And so when Jesus dies on the cross, we discover that the justice of God is retained as perfect and beautiful. God is brilliant in this way. But what was the cost? The cost is that the Father in heaven watched his son walk the way to the cross. He watched him suffer and die. But he did that for us. Now, that is a beautiful message, isn't it? Because the blood of Jesus is so powerful that no matter what you've done no matter how bad the crime is that you've committed the blood of Jesus covers all of it now that's a beautiful message when you think about it in terms of yourself isn't it it brings you joy it brings you smiles but then we have the other side of grace that's perhaps a little more offensive right Grace is good when I receive it. But what about when your enemies, what about when people who have hurt you, and I mean really hurt you, what about them? Is grace as beautiful for you then when God says, guess what, they can have it too if they turn to me? There's a great story in the Old Testament. You've heard of a man named Jonah before. Jonah was a Jew. Uh, The Jewish people lived south of a place called Assyria. In Assyria, they were a big oppressive nation. The Assyrians were horrible to the Jewish people. They literally brought hell on earth to the Jewish people. At times, they slaughtered Jews. They carried Jews away in exile. They treated them like dogs. To the Jews, Assyrians were God's enemy. This is not good. Well, Jonah is doing his own thing, and God says, listen, Jonah, I have a job for you. Those people over in a town called Nineveh, which is the capital of Assyria, he says, those people over there are having a hard time right now. 
They're doing a lot of really evil things. And Jonah, I love them too. So I want you to go over to Nineveh, and I want you to proclaim my love for them. Basically, my grace. That if you turn to me, there's going to be hope and love. But Jonah can't handle this. He can't handle that message. So Jonah runs away. You know the story. Basically, God says, you can try running, but I'm going to get you back there, right? uh, A whale swallows Jonah, spits him up on shore. Jonah has no other choice to go. So reluctantly, Jonah goes to Nineveh with a message of God's grace. Now, he doesn't proclaim it very well. He just walks around saying, hey, by the way, in just a little while, Nineveh is going to be destroyed. But when the Ninevites heard this message, even though Jonah did a bad job telling it, Man, they become so broken. They all weep, and the scriptures say that they repent. They turn to God, and then all of a sudden, what happens? There's a party going on in heaven, right? And God has mercy, and he has compassion on the Ninevites. Now, while the party's going on in heaven, Jonah, what's he doing? Well, he he decides that he's going to throw a pity party for himself. He sits under a tree and he complains about the mercy and the grace extended to Nineveh. See, Jonah did not get the grace of God. Or maybe he understood it, but he didn't come to the point where he realized that grace for him should mean grace for the world, right? He totally missed it. Now, are we ready to get uncomfortable? Anybody? Let's get uncomfortable. I was thinking today, or this last couple weeks, what would be my Nineveh? What is your Nineveh? What is the Nineveh of planet Earth right now? Well, if you've been reading the news, you might come to this conclusion. I know I told you you'd be uncomfortable. Um, the man in black, if you've been following the news, is about to execute this, uh, this gentleman. This gentleman has done nothing wrong. He's a prisoner that has been taken by ISIS. If you've been following that, it's a militant group in the Middle East that has literally slain uh, thousands of innocent people. Um, if you get online and look at pictures, it will just make you cry. And I look at that picture, and I, I hate this situation. You probably do too. I hate the slaughtering of women and children and men who are innocent. It is an ugly, ugly thing. And you know what? Guess what? Our God is a just God. He hates this too. Why? Because God loves people. What does sin do? Sin of any kind hurts people, right? That's why God hates sin. He hates what's going on because he loves the people that these folks are hurting. But then, we look at this guy in black. Is the power of the cross enough to save this gentleman if he turns to Jesus Christ? It is. The gospel says the blood of Jesus is enough to save even this man. That in the end of his life, if he ends up on a cross next to Jesus like the thief on the cross, if this man turns to Jesus, guess what? the heavens will rejoice. Now, when I say that, I'll be honest with you. As I was thinking through this sermon, I was like, this is not going to feel good. It feels icky for me to say that. It feels icky for me to say that this man who just, who on the, <laughs> publicly or, you know, beheaded this man on a video and sent it around the world, it makes me feel icky. And so, I pray to God. I say, God, just honest, God, this makes me feel icky that you could save a man such as him. But here's the problem. Once I begin to feel icky and I say, God, and I say, well, why should God be able to save a man like him? What have I just done to the gospel? Well, I've just really made it about works, right? I said, well, he's done worse things than me. So he's not as worthy as me to become a Christian and to be saved by the grace of Jesus Christ. In fact, if I say that he's not worthy, I'm looking at my Savior. And I'm saying, Jesus, your blood wasn't enough. And so I have to repent. And I have to say, God, would you give me a right heart? 
As Christians, we're called to share in the anger of God towards the injustice in our world. We are also called to share in the heart of God that desires for every last human being to turn to God. And we need to learn even, even by the grace of God, God, help me to celebrate if this man turns to you because I know that you're celebrating. That's the difficulty, isn't it, in the message of grace but Jesus reminds all of us when we were lost when we were on that bus ride from Detroit to Traverse City, Michigan wondering what the extent of God's love was like our father was waiting for us his love was unconditional and his love was infinite and he came with open arms and he threw me a party and what does God want for, me to, want for us to do? well he wants us to recognize there's a party, and our job is to go around and invite people into the party. Our job is to have the same heart towards people that God has towards people. I love Jesus on the cross. He hangs on the cross, or as he, as he walks through you know, pain and suffering, and people are mocking him. What does Jesus do? We see his heart. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Sometimes we hear these stories of like missionaries whose families have been murdered, but then we see a picture of the missionary with his hand around the person who murdered his family, and we're all blown away. The world is blown away. What grace, what forgiveness. Where does that power come from? The power comes from realizing that the extraordinary debt that we have before holy God has been paid for. The debt anyone else has against us or we have against them, it's nothing in comparison. And so as believers, may the story of God's grace, may the truth of God's grace rest deeply in our souls because it is precisely that this truth that we will become free and we will look like the people that God wants us to look like in a world that is very broken, that desperately needs the gospel. So with those words... Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are the shepherd, God. Though we are all lost, though we all run away, you're always on our tails. And you're saying, please reach out your hand and experience new life and freedom. God, I don't know everybody in this room nor everybody's story in this room. But if you're on the outside looking in and you haven't quite found what it is that you are looking for, this morning, just invite you as you pray to cry help to God. Because no matter where you've been or what you've done, Jesus is there with open arms and he promises that when you call out to him, he will breathe new life into you. He will make you a new creation and he will wrap his arms around you in this life and the life to come. So please, if you need to, would you cry out this morning? For those of us who have cried out maybe recently or a long time ago, help us never to lose sight of how beautiful that gift is. The fact that we can stand up proudly, not boasting ourselves, but boasting the fact that we've been saved by your grace. You're a good father. And we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In response to the gospel of grace, let's stand. Let's sing in joy and gratitude. of every blessing tune my heart to sing thy praise streams of mercy 